And here recorded in Luke's Gospel and the 18th chapter is one of the greatest stories ever told. It is a parable from the lips of our Lord given to illustrate a very important principle. It is familiar to most of us. We have heard it and seen it and listened to it preached. But we pray that today God will use it to reflect in our hearts his glory and to teach us something that we have not known before. Luke chapter 18, beginning our reading at the ninth verse. And Jesus spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week, I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For every one that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. May we pray. Lord, we thank you for this time that we have. These moments, few though they be, that we can concentrate on your word. It is hard to believe that taking these moments out of the schedule of a 24-hour day could have any real impact on our lives. From the human perspective, we know that it cannot. But God, you meet us in these moments of time through your word and by the power of your Holy Spirit, you allow the moments of time to have eternal impact on us. You cause that we are changed in such a way that we can never be the same again. And we ask that you would do that today. Lord, redeem this time for your honor and your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. When we began this series, I remember telling you that the justification for the use of stories in communicating truth is finally coming to the forefront of communication. And I mentioned that having been in a seminar with a man by the name of Gary Smalley, who told me at that time that he was doing research and was preparing to write a book on the importance of using word pictures or stories to communicate truth at a level far deeper than we are able to communicate with simply the communication of facts. It's a book called The Language of Love and it's written by Gary Smalley and John Trent. It's published by Focus on the Family Publishers and it is, in my estimation, destined to make quite an impact upon Christian culture. The book you see helps us to see that our mind functions far differently than we perceive it to function. That when we communicate just the information of an issue, we fall short of making the kind of impact that communication seeks to make. The purpose of all communication is change. If we want to see change in our lives and in our families, we need to learn how to communicate. Perhaps I can illustrate that by sharing with you something from the beginning of Gary's book. He begins by telling us a real life story of a family that came to a crisis and ended up being separated. Literally what happened was the father lost interest in his wife and in his children, got involved with another woman, and just one day walked away from it all. It was a very difficult thing for all of them, and when the wife and Kimberly, the daughter, tried to communicate with Dad, he either wouldn't answer the phone calls, or he would not stay and talk with them when they tried to get him as he came to the house. It seemed as if he had determined he was going to do his thing, and he had shut himself off from any communication at all. And then one day, not knowing the importance and impact of a parable or a story, Kimberly wrote her father this letter. It came to him in the stack of mail that he opened during his lunch hour. And when he saw her name on the top of it, he thought that it was simply some incidental card. Maybe it was his birthday and he had forgotten. But he opened to read this letter. Dear Daddy, it's late at night, and I'm sitting in the middle of my bed writing to you. 
I've wanted to talk with you so many times during the past few weeks, but there never seems to be any time when we're alone. Dad, I realize you're dating someone else, and I know you and Mom may never get back together again. That's terribly hard to accept, especially knowing that you may never come back home and be an everyday dad to me and Brian anymore. But at least I want you to understand what's going on in our lives. Don't think that Mom asked me to do this. She doesn't even know I'm writing to you, and neither does Brian. I just want to share with you what I've been thinking. I feel like our family has been riding in a nice car for a long time. You know the kind of car you always like to have as a company car. It's the kind of car that has every extra inside and not a scratch on the outside. But over the years, the car has developed some problems. Smoking a lot, the wheels wobble a little, and the seat covers are ripped. But still a great automobile, and it could be even greater with a little work. I know it could run for years. Since we got the car, Brian and I have been in the back seat while you and Mom have been up front. We really feel secure with you driving and Mom beside you. But last month, Mom was at the wheel. It was nighttime, and we had just turned the corner near our house. Suddenly, we all looked up and saw another car out of control, heading straight for us. Mom tried to swerve out of the way, but the other car still smashed into us, and the impact sent us flying off the road and crashing into a lamppost. The thing is, Dad, just before being hit, we could see that you were driving that other car, and we saw something else. Sitting next to you was another woman. Such a terrible accident that we were all rushed to the emergency ward. But when we asked where you were, no one knew. We're still not really sure where you are, or if you're hurt, or if you need help. Mom was really hurt. She was thrown into the steering wheel and broke several ribs. One of them punctured her lungs and almost pierced her heart. When the car wrecked, the back door slammed into Brian, and he was covered with cuts from the broken glass, and he shattered his arm, which is now in a cast. But that's not the worst. He's still in so much pain and shock that he doesn't want to talk or play with anyone. As for me, well, I was thrown from the car. I was stuck out in the cold for a long time with my right leg broken. As I lay there, I couldn't move and didn't know what was wrong with Mom and Brian. I was hurting so much myself that I couldn't help Mom. There have been times since that night when I wondered if any of us would make it. Even though we're getting a little better, we're still in the hospital. The doctors say I'll need a lot of therapy. And I know they can help me get better, but I wish it was you who was helping me instead of them. The pain is so bad, but what's even worse is that we all miss you so much. Every day we wait to see if you're going to visit us in the hospital, and every day you don't come. I know it's over, but my heart would explode with joy if somehow I could look up and see you walk into my room. At night when the hospital is really quiet, they push Brian and me into Mom's room and we talk about you. We talk about how much we love driving with you and how we wish you were with us now. Are you all right? Are you hurting from the wreck? Do you need us like we need you? If you need me, I'm here and I love you. Your daughter, Kimberly. Well, Kimberly had tried to say to her father, Why did you do this? Why don't you come home? And it just went right over the top of his head. But when he got this note and he read it, it created a mental picture in his mind that he couldn't escape from. And he saw the picture of this wreck. Every time he had a moment to think, he saw this wreck. And that picture communicated to him what was going on in the life of his daughter and in his family. While all stories don't end in a happy way, Kimberly and her word picture was the means of bringing that family back together. For she didn't just communicate to her father. She told a parable and painted a picture that got to the very core of where that man lived so that he was totally changed by what he heard. I never really understood for the longest time why Jesus used so many stories. You know, if you're a preacher and you tell too many stories, they get on your case. They say, why, all he does is tell stories. And sometimes, if we're not careful, we can tell stories for the sake of stories. But parables or stories or word pictures are the most powerful means of communicating known to man, apart from drama or the reenactment of a situation. No wonder Jesus was the master storyteller. He had truth that he wanted to deposit in the hearts of his people so that they would never forget it. Now, if I were to say to you today that Jesus was opposed to ostentatious religion, most of you wouldn't even write it down. 
But if I tell you the story that Jesus told, you won't be able to quickly forget it. For the Bible tells us in the ninth verse of the 18th chapter that Jesus told a story to certain who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Now Jesus could have walked up to those who trusted in themselves and despised others and said, stop trusting in yourself and stop despising others. That would be the direct route. But he didn't do that. He said, I want to tell you a story. There were two men who went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other was a publican. First of all, he speaks of the Pharisee. Most of us have used that term in some derogatory way at one time or another in our lives. When we get good and mad at somebody, even though we know not what it means, we may call him nothing but a Pharisee. But you see, a Pharisee literally was one who was separated from all others. The word Pharisee comes from the word to be separated. And the Jewish scribes and rabbis, beginning from the great principles of the Ten Commandments, had amplified the Jewish law until it included tens of thousands of petty regulations covering every moment and every action in life. And they considered that the keeping of these regulations was a matter of life and death. They weren't content just to observe the Old Testament Jewish law. They took every law and added to it sub-laws. So that every law had unwritten laws that you had to know in order for you to qualify to be a part of the Pharisaic sect of people. For instance, the Pharisees believed that to eat your meal without washing your hands was almost an unforgivable sin. Now I need to confess to you that I have no Pharisees living in my house. None of my children are Pharisees. But they not only said you had to wash your hands before you ate, but you had to wash your hands according to a certain, certain style. You had to wash your hands, first of all, by putting the water over your fingers and rubbing it into your hand with your other fist and then letting it drip down off of your wrist. And when you were finished, you had to turn your hand over, start the process over, and wash your hands so that the water dripped down off of your fingers. And if you didn't do it exactly that way, then you were violating the strictest laws of the Pharisees, and you were no longer in fellowship with them. And obviously, it was very difficult for them to function within the common run of, of people in life, so they could not be a part of the, of the give and take of life. They separated themselves out from life and set up their own little group, and they didn't associate with any of the other people. They kept to themselves. They believed that they were better than others because they not only did the law, they did better than the law. If the law said go a mile, they constructed a law that said go two miles, and they would do that. Now, Pharisees were not bad men in the sense that we consider men bad, but they were men who were very confused about how one is justified before God, and they considered themselves better than all the rest. You've probably heard the story about the Baptist group that's supposed to be pharisaical and when someone was walking through heaven one day with a friend they said to their friend Shh, don't say a word and the friend said why he says we're walking by the Baptist group and they think they're the only ones here <laughs> and that's the way a Pharisee functions <laughs> a Pharisee considers himself separate from the rest I read a statement by Rabbi Simeon who reduced the thing almost to a parody He said, if there are only two righteous men in the world, I and my son are those two. If there is only one, I am he. That's the way a Pharisee thinks. Now the Bible says that of the two men who went to pray, one was a Pharisee. And he displays his pride, first of all, by his posture. The scripture says that as he went to pray, he stood to pray. Now, there are two words for standing in this text. The first one of the Pharisee has a picture of a person standing, almost gives the impression of parading. He is posing. He is standing with the proper pose to pray so that others can see him. And uh, the scripture says he is standing apart. And notice, he is not praying to God. He's not praying about God. The Bible says he is praying with himself. Isn't that strange? If a man is justified by himself, According to the standards he sets up for himself, he has nothing left to do but pray with himself. He's the only one he can communicate with. So he is standing there, posing, and he is praying with himself. 
His pride is displayed not only in his posture, but his pride is displayed in his prayer. Notice how he prays. First of all, he uses the word God. It was not even a reverent address. There's no sense of sin or reverence or coming to God with a repentant heart. He comes directly to God and addresses him. And he says, God. And if you go back to the ninth verse, you can see immediately that Jesus is getting at this point of a person who trusts in himself and despises others. Because in his prayer is this whole concept of despising others. Watch what he prays. He prays three things. First of all, he thanks God for three sins that he does not commit. He thanks God for one man to whom he cannot be compared, and he thanks God for two good deeds which he continues to do. Now watch, first of all, the three sins which he says he does not commit. He says, O oh God, I thank you that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust adulterers. An extortioner was someone who took money which he did not have the right to take, An unjust person was somebody who cheated others. And of course, adultery to a Pharisee was the unforgivable sin. And it was the zenith of all rebellion against God. Now the Pharisee stands in this proper place in the temple and he prays, Oh God, I thank you that I am not as other men. I am not an extortioner. I am not unjust. I am not an adulterer. And God should have cried out right then, Yes, but you are the proudest man I have ever talked to. It's easy for us to condemn the sins in others which are not true of us while we ourselves are harboring sins which are worse. And anyone who wants to justify himself need only look around to find someone who is a little lower on the rung of self-justification and find a standard in that person to push himself up. One of the reasons why we cut each other down so much is because if we can cut somebody else down, we can step on the body of their ruin and feel better about ourselves. And the Pharisee is standing there saying, God, I'm so thankful I'm not like other men. I'm not an extortioner, which the publican was. I'm not unjust, which the publican was. And I'm not an adulterer. Perhaps he was that too. So there were three things that he did not commit. But notice there was one person to whom he should not be compared. Looking across the temple while he prayed, he said, I thank you, God, that I am not like that publican, not like him. There were traditions all around about the Pharisees, and the tradition is that a Pharisee ought to thank God every day of his life for three things. And Pharisees used to do this. Every day they were to thank God for three things. Number one, that they were not born a Gentile. Number two, that they were not a plebeian or an ordinary Roman citizen. And number three, that they were not born a woman. That's the three things a Pharisee praised God for every day. Now, you talk about a feminist reaction to something. That's where it all started, right back there. The Pharisees started it. The sin of pride not only separates us from God, you see, it separates us from other other people. When you are a proud person, you can't stand before God, but you can't stand in fellowship with anyone else. Here this man is standing before God, and in his prayer, he separated himself from another person. I'm not like him. Pharisee boasts that he is not like the rest of mankind. He looked with pride on the majority of men who were sinners. He speaks of three sins which he has not committed. He speaks of one man to whom he is not to be compared. And then he lists two virtues which he has commanded. Now watch this. I fast twice in the week and I give tithes of all that I possess. Marvelous. Well, what's so great about that? Well, first of all, the Jewish law only required a Jew to fast one day a year. On the Day of Atonement, a Jew was required to fast. What is this guy saying? I'm doing a hundred times more than I'm required. I don't just fast one day a year, friend. I fast twice a week. I want you to know that. 